This is the Jeff Santos Show. Thirty-three minutes past the hour. It is the Jeff Santos Show that you are tuned into. We have some open phone lines here as we uh, try to bring in our good friend Mark Taylor Canfield, who is uh, uh, around about uh, the great uh, 206, the great city of Seattle, WA, uh, here on the uh, Jeff Santos Show. We're going to open up the uh, phone lines, though, at 772-223-2362 in a second. You can also email me, jeff, at revolutionboston.com. And, and of course, uh, you can always uh, post on Facebook and Twitter at Jeff Santos Show. Um, I want to go back to uh, our good friend John and and and, and Mark as well uh, before we get to uh, to Mark Taylor Canfield, and I think it is uh, it is important here, um, you know, to kind of follow up on what we have been doing for the past hour and a half here in talking about human rights and talking about the uh, situation. Uh, Mark, can you hear me? Okay, Mark Taylor Canfield cannot hear us, so we'll hopefully try to get him back uh, in the next uh, couple of minutes. I'm fascinated um, by, I think, where a lot of uh, the listeners are and getting emails and calls uh, from some folks, uh, I should say texts. Uh, the, the fact is, is that I, I think, as, as, as people said earlier, people want to change. Uh, and we have not seen change from the Biden administration. Uh, it's been limited. Again, as I said yesterday at the beginning of of yesterday's show, I am not here to just destroy Joe Biden. That's not who I am. That's not what I'm about. We don't have but just one president. The question is, is we cannot allow him to push us to the side of the wall and just stand there and take it. We got to fight back and we got to fight and push him and push him to a, a perspective and to a place where he can be the successful next president uh like lbj like fdr he may not be as the iconic situation but we need desperately some kind of version otherwise the democratic party will demise it's it's that simple uh john i know that we had uh, uh some some problems uh earlier uh and not giving you enough times but i think you probably have heard a good part of the show here and I, I think there is a consensus, um, and I, I would say it's just it's larger than the progressive elements or people who identify themselves as progressives. I think it's a lot of people who, whether they're independents or folks that are just you know flat out sick and tired of status quo uh, world that they find themselves in. Uh, your view, from uh, your perspective, you've had a chance to listen to a little bit today. Oh yeah, um, well I. You know, one thing I think that Justin uh, Blake brought up that I thought was very good was the fact that, um, you know, Israel is empowered to do what they do just in the same way that the police are empowered to do what they do uh, by the powers that be. They're given a carte blanche and a hell of a lot of money to do it, you know. So this is the, this is the issue you know, uh, when we talk about Palestine, this is the problem. And, uh, you know, this isn't coming from me. This is from the editor of Haaretz, uh, uh newspaper, uh, Gideon Levy. Levy. He, he said, you know, uh, Palestinians have been taught, you know, it's, it's like a drug. You know, they just get this $3.8 billion or even more. I, I don't, I hear so many different figures uh, that they get a year, but, you know, it, it just uh, says to them, oh, well, the world doesn't care, and we're the most, you know, hegemonic power in the world. Uh, as, uh, as Alan, uh, you know, said, we, we have hegemony. So, you know, we're in, we're in charge. We're preventing the U.N. from, you know, having a resolution uh, to condemn Israel. And if you, you know, you, you just slapping their hands, and and then hugging them or just limiting it to oh this you know little uh, you know thing that happened where 221 uh, people died and now they have a ceasefire. Uh, Norman Finkelstein, who is a, an expert in Arab Palestinian relations, uh, you know says that uh, 
they call it mowing the lawn. I, I mean, and that's not from him. He didn't make that term up. This is what the leadership of, of Israel uh, called them. I, I mean, the, the decadence and the absolute cruelty, uh, it's a slow genocide what they do. Uh, and there's another uh, journalist, like a professor, I you know have her name written down, but uh, Aracock, and she was interviewed, and uh, her brother was murdered at a checkpoint, and uh, they said, you know, that he accelerated when he didn't accelerate, and they used excessive force, and they they killed him. I mean, you know, they sent like ten, you know, bullets through his body, and uh, but even worse than that. They won't give the body to the family. This is where yeah, no, that's this just that's decadent, just uh, it, it, yeah. it's beyond the pale. It, it's, it's so they, so beyond the pale, yeah. and I think that's a yeah. great term for it. Uh, uh, Mark, uh, John, I think it's, it's it's so it's so critical, and you know we we just found uh, Mark so, Taylor Camp. We're going to get to him in a second, but but I think you're oh, right, sure. and I think what has to happen now is that we need to move um, a lightning speed to the progressive agenda. As as uh, Alan Minsky said, we got about three months here, and I think it's time yeah. that uh, you know that every progressive Democrat get on the phone, go after Joe Manchin, go after in a peaceful way. We're not advocating any violence well, here. I want to make that yeah. very clear. A two zero two 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 four thirty one twenty one. Flood the phone lines. You know, make everyone clear that he's going to be known as the Jim Crow of the twenty first century if he doesn't allow the filibuster to go through, which will allow HR one to go through, uh, which of and course then, is now then, Senate Bill one, and 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 make that yeah. uh, the law to protect people's right to vote. <laughs> End of story. And uh, you know, I, I get a lot of things on Facebook because they must be on a progressive you know, feed on my phone, and they're asking for money, you know, to uh, undo the filibuster and, you know, try to, to change the situation. So it, it's out there. I mean, you know, people oh, yeah. are no, no. cognizant it's, of it's it. It's there. And they're aware I, I, of we it. Just need- we just need to make sure yeah. all the action is is exactly there. Thank you, John. I really appreciate your yeah, comments, yeah, and uh, I'm glad yep. we gave him a chance. Uh, all right, I'm going to do before we get to Mark Taylor Canfield, and we see he's on the board with us. So hang in there, MTC. I want to take a quick uh, uh, shot up to uh, San Francisco and talk to our good friend uh, Mark uh, Mark A from the great city of San Francisco. I know Mark, you wanted to uh, maybe give us more information on on what is happening with the Heritage Foundation. Go right ahead. Yeah, well, the Heritage Foundation uh, is going around bragging. Uh, to their constituents, the people that are funding them, uh, that they're pushing this legislation all over the country. Um, it's an ongoing assault, and uh, I just think we need to change our, uh, our our tactics and go after the people funding these Republicans. And they're just puppets, but the people funding them are the ones behind it. We need to put pressure on them. That's our strategy that we need to, to change going forward. The other thing, too, is I think we need to also, uh, somebody in the Democratic Party, to stand up and say, when you elect a politician, you need to elect a politician. You need to look at his standing. Does he believe that the uh, election was uh, legitimate? One. If you don't, then you're, you should be disqualified. If you b- uh, believe in voter suppression, you should be disqualified. If you're a nut or a, a wing nut like this uh, Marjorie Green Taylor, you're not qualified to be in Congress. Right. We need to have higher standards and ask higher standards of people that we send to Washington and point out the Republican Party has failed in doing that. I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, spot on, Mark, as usual, and, and thank you uh, for doing that. And uh, we're going to talk with uh, representatives along with uh, Justin Blake about uh, uh, trying to find a way to uh, uh, publicize what you told us about regarding uh, uh, our friends at the Heritage Foundation. Thank you, Mark. Uh, have yourself a good weekend. I um, want to take uh, uh, a trip now further north on Interstate 5 and uh, find our good friend, the Renaissance Man, uh, from the great uh, 206, uh, Mr. Mark Taylor Canfield. Uh, MTC, great to have you, my friend. I know we had a little technical uh, problems getting you on the line there, but uh, um, hello and happy Friday. Yeah, I finally figured it out. Can you hear me okay? I can, actually, very clearly. Oh, <laughs> I have a good microphone. That's a nice thing. Um, yeah, I was sitting here, and I was, I was going to give you a tribute. Again. So 
Well, there's Mr. Love the Jimi Hendrix. So, hello, yeah. hello. <laughs> uh, Hendrix yeah. calling. Um, hey, man, now that's uh, that is uh, fantastic sound. Um, look, we got so much uh, in a, a short window here. Um, I want to run by you, but I, I guess the first thing is, is since uh, there are a lot of mayoral races around the country here in Boston, uh, we could have a uh, first uh, woman of uh, color uh, elected. Uh, you have, uh, of course, a big one in New York City. And I believe in Seattle, you guys have a, a race for mayor, too. We haven't talked about that much. What is the latest there? Well, there is a, a full slate of candidates, you know, and this is something um, I've been I've been a little overwhelmed with these international journalism conferences that everybody's doing that, I, you know, I've been doing online with a lot of really innovative reporters. So I haven't followed the uh, mayor's campaign as much as I should. But the one thing that did surprise me is that uh, Colleen Echo Hawk, who was sort of the front runner uh, right out of the starting gate, so to speak. Uh, to use a sports metaphor, she was ahead of everybody. She had, I think, 40 community meetings with people and was way out in front in declaring her candidacy. But actually, Lorena Gonzalez, the um, president of the Seattle City Council, and some other candidates are also getting a lot of attention. So it's kind of a, an open race at this point, Jeff, and I was surprised about that. I thought that she would be way out in head. But if you just look at just purely from the, the press that the candidates are getting, uh, there, there are several candidates that could win this, so it's up in the air right now. It's, a, it's an open race, and uh, we'll see what happens. I'm, you know, I'm hoping, of course, that um, that somebody like a Colleen Echo Hawk or a Lorena Gonzalez will win, because I think it would be really good for the city to have people who have kind of been down in the trenches on issues like civil rights and immigration to be there in that office. Um, I think it's high time for that, um, and. You know, other than that, you know, I was also working on that film set. And, by the way, I didn't ask um, Zoe Kravitz for her autograph because I thought it would be really unprofessional since she was in character. But that, Well, they used to get her phone were, number, right? <laughs> well, we have ways of getting in touch, but that's also... Um, <laughs> there you go. Daughter, and I really enjoy his guitar playing as well, his music. So I'm like... Um, yeah, I mean, talk about uh, Hendrix Jr. in a sense, that. right? Yeah. I mean... We both, I think he and I both have been influenced by Jimi Hendrix, you know, and that's obvious in some, in some of his work. But, uh, yeah, and then there's this, there's this sort of revolution that uh, is going on in journalism right now, which I'm noticing. At yeah, I, I want to I get to that because we've been spending a lot of time here on the show on, on the issue of, um, of, of the Palestinian-Israeli um, conflict. And in my feeling here is that what Israel did in bombing um, that building, now everybody has seen, um, you know, be torn to the ground, uh, there were Al Jazeera and uh, Associated Press, and journalists, uh, thankfully they weren't in the building at the time, uh, that uh, that were there, amongst others, including uh, medical doctors who were saving the lives of, uh, of many Jewish uh, folks there in Israel. Um, and it was, it was just deplorable. I'm wondering if you can give me a perspective about how um, uh, Reporters Without Borders and, and some of the folks at the conference are looking at that in you know, interviews later on MSNBC places where these reporters were just astonished. And all this is nonsense about, well, this was an area for Hamas, and they were hiding out. According to one of the, one of the Algeria's, Al Jazeera reporters, that was not the case. Uh, in fact, they know a lot of the people that come in. And I'm, I'm wondering if you can uh, talk a little bit about that. Well, it's it can be a rough business, and there were uh, there was discussion of this. That was one of the topics that I covered during this last um, collaborative journalism summit, which has been taking place through the auspices of uh, Montclair State University there in North Carolina. And by the way, there's a lot of really great um, collaborative journalism going on in North Carolina right now, which is a really great model for people to follow. But there were also representatives there from um, organizations that have been doing some very serious. Uh, investigative journalism in Europe, and uh, especially on the issue of money laundering. And uh, there was a journalist who was working with some of uh, some of those uh, organizations who was killed, and that had to do with a, 
um, an investigation into, like I said, money laundering. And there's a group called the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project, which a lot of these groups like Reporters Without Borders and the Committee to Protect Journalists um, help um, collaborate with. And, you know, so they were covering money laundering in Turkmenistan and um, Azerbaijan and all these other places. that, uh, And some of that money was ending up in Europe. Well, one of their reporters was killed. And um, so his colleague uh, gave kind of a heartfelt um, memorial to him and then said, you know, she was about ready to quit being a journalist and just throw, throw her, you know, just throw it all away and do something else. But she was encouraged by some of her colleagues to say, you know, take some time to deal with this emotionally, of course. Um, but, you know, don't stop because that's exactly what um, the violence is meant to do is to stop journalists from speaking out and being there at the um in the occupied zones or you know at the protests or whatever i mean it's a really important issue so reporters without borders and the committee to protect journalists um and also the international consortium for investigative journalists have been um really involved in a lot of these issues and um they you know there was obviously talk about what's going on in palestine because when you have reporters that are out there in the field uh, we as a industry have to try to make sure that they're protected, you know, and this idea that, you know, they, they can be targets um, is just not going to fly with any organization that believes in freedom of the press. And, if, you know, and if you believe in democracy, then you believe in freedom of the press. So you, you can't really separate the two. So my, my hope, though, Jeff, is that a lot of the new journalism that's happening is exploring brand new models um, and it's been evidenced in all of these international journalism conferences I've been to lately that there is a major pushback against the traditional structure that reigns in most corporate news organizations. And it's being challenged by a lot of really young, hungry reporters just, you know, reproduce infotainment. So they're stressing the importance of solutions-based journalism, which is a whole new idea that is kind of taking over in some of these independent news organizations. And they all also, they're really concentrating on developing news departments that involve people of color that actually reflects the communities that they serve. And that is mm. probably a direct result of the Black Lives Matter movement and the pressure. Yeah, I, I want to. Yeah. No, I, I think that's fascinating because we've been we've been tying and we just had Justin Blake on Jacob Blake's uncle, yeah. uh, who, of course, was tortured. And, of course, uh, his uh, his nephew was uh, shot several times in the back in that Kenosha, Wisconsin case, which saw a lot of the the uh, Major League Baseball and NBA and others cancel their sporting events after that incident happened, which, of course, wasn't very, um, you know, which was just, uh, you know, months and months ago. But the the, the fact is, is that. The comparison between what is happening in Gaza and what has happened to the likes of Floyd and, and Blake and many others, um, to me, is, 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 is fascinating. And I'm wondering, we, we have been hearing that a lot of this is youth-focused. The journalists that you're seeing, I mean, are they the millennials? And are, are we seeing a change from your perspective that it is generational, you know. If you want to make a comparison to the to the Watergate class, to the the the, the young millennials of that time period, uh, you know, marching against the Vietnam War, marching against. I'm not saying the the, the, the congressional class, but that time period, the civil rights that led up to Watergate um, and the Vietnam anti into Vietnam. Um, do you see that? And what uh, were they talking about that as a as a theme in the conference? Well, there is, you know, that wasn't as much of a theme as just in evidence by the age of the folks that are in a lot of these new organizations. And, of course, there's always been the Native American Journalists Association and other um, foundations and, and organizations that are trying to represent people of color in the media. But now it's more like people are creating their own media. They're tired of being... Um, pushed aside and their voices not being heard in the mostly, you know, um, white do male dominated news organizations. So they're forming their own. So the tiny news collective down there in North Carolina is doing a, a bang up job. There's also, um, as I mentioned before, documented in New York city, um, completely POC run. There are organizations like capital B, which are, um, organized specifically by black Americans for black Americans. 
Um, this is a new phenomena, and people are, are just fed up, Jeff. They've had enough. They want change, and they also want solutions-based journalism. They don't want to just be the bearer of bad news. They want to say, hey, this is, these are the problems, and these are some of the proposals that have been – or these are some of the ideas that have been proposed to fix the problems. And that's a major theme, I think, that's running through a lot of this, too. But it is a generational shift as well, uh, and, and a cultural shift. There, there's a lot of new um, bilingual and Spanish media that's happening. The Hispanic communities and all across the country have been organizing their own independent news organizations. And it's just, it's good to see. It's good to see fresh people entering the industry who are enthusiastic and are not going to take no for an answer, that are ready for change and aren't, aren't going to stand in the way because... For many, many years, those of us who have been in the media know that uh, there are certain issues that just don't get reported. And um, it's always oh, yeah. been in it me that uh, issues that affect people of color have never been well represented in corporate U.S. media. And this is issue, of course, of our ranking on the World Press Freedom Index of number 44 in the world is another um, issue. It's, it's like a thorn in my side that I get so frustrated about when I can't get any um, traction with major corporate new, mainstream news um, in reporting that. They're just, I guess, embarrassed and don't want to say it. But, you know, there are countries countries like Namibia, Costa Rica, that are much farther ahead on the list than we are. And we really, as American journalists, publishers, um, editors, uh, need to take this on and improve our, our ranking. But I'm having a hard time getting um, people at these conferences to kind of rally behind that flag. They're, they seem to be really interested in some other, some other very, very important things that need to be addressed, and I'm glad they are being addressed, especially equity in the media. The equity uh, in media project also in North Carolina is a very important model for what's been going on. There's a whole um, collaborative journalism project, and it's supported by the Center for Collaborative Journalism at Montclair State University, and it's happening in North Carolina. It's one of the places where there are models for organizing journalism that are based much more on collaboration, by the way, than competition, which, of course, is the current model for the, the for-profit um, uh, media and press. But, you know, they, we are considered non-profit organizations like Democracy Watch News and the other folks. There were some, you know, definitely not, there were definitely profit organizations represented. The Washington Post was there, which is owned by Jay, you know, Jeff Bezos, you know, the Dallas Morning News, who actually has had its own problems with accusations of racial bias and, and lack of coverage of, of issues that affect immigrants, people of color. But there, you know, there are a lot of independent organizations that are considered mission-based that actually are trying to serve the public interest, and that's their main priority, that are nonprofit. And there are foundations like the Knight Foundation that helps fund that kind of thing. And with these organizations, there's a new movement happening, which I'm really excited about, Jeff. I've met some really authentic people in journalism who are in it for the right reason. They're not in it, you know, to look good on TV. They actually want to help serve their communities. And this is a new phenomenon that I'm really excited about. So step aside, corporate well, that, folks. That's great to hear. Yeah, yeah. no, I yeah. think that's that's an important piece of, uh, of the agenda here. Uh, Mark, you know, unfortunately we're running out of time, but I, I must tell you I think it is really important uh, to follow what you're doing um, I know you always give out your uh, your uh, website and and, uh, and email addresses and, and also your Twitter. Uh, go ahead and do that now as as we uh, you know end this segment because I think people should be able to contact you and, uh, and all the great uh, information that you're giving us uh, from uh, the great 206. Uh, go right ahead before we roll, Mark. Well, I'm at YouTube under Mark Taylor Canfield, so you can find my YouTube channel there. And if you subscribe there, you'll get um, all the latest updates and media stuff that I do and some of my music videos as well. And then there's also Twitter. So I'm big on Twitter at M. Taylor Canfield. And that's where a lot of the journalism happens. It's pretty apparent that journalists rely a lot on Twitter, and that's going to continue the, the trends that we saw at these conferences show that more journalists are more and more focused on Twitter as a way of breaking news. There's also Facebook, of course, so you can follow me on Facebook. And then um, I'm also at Democracy Watch News, which is democracywatchnews.org. And you can find me at Instagram. I'm actually on that platform now, too. So um, once again, Mark Taylor Canfield. So it's easy to find me if you put my name in a search engine. All sorts of stuff will pop up. And, uh, thank you, Mark. I appreciate media. it, my friend. No, I thank you. Uh, you keep on fighting for us. We'll be in touch. We'll talk to you next week. Have yourself a good one, my man. Uh, I want to thank uh, Ron Carter for producing this broadcast. 
Thanks to all the great uh, contributors today, uh, Harvey Kay, Alan Minsky, Harold Meyerson, Mark Taylor Canfield, uh, of course, uh, Justin Blake, and all of you callers, folks, so we all together can make a difference here. And we'll have uh, some news for you next week. We look forward to that. Uh, we look forward to having a good weekend. Please be safe out there. Keep on fighting peacefully. We're going to be able to uh, make a difference, folks. Everyone can. Right now, I wish you a happy weekend because right now it is my time to say I gotta go! And now the 100.7 FM, WEHR, Eternal Hope Radio, Treasure Coast weather forecast for Tuesday and Wednesday. For Tuesday, a mix of clouds and sun, high about 86 degrees, winds east-southeast 10 to 15 miles per hour. And then on Tuesday night, partly cloudy, low 68, winds east-southeast 10 to 15 miles per hour again. On Wednesday, partly cloudy, high 87, low 67, winds east-southeast 10 to 15 miles per hour. This Treasure Coast weather forecast is always broadcast at least 12 times daily here on 100.7 FM WEHR. Live, this is the Jeff Santos Show on the Revolution Radio Network. Rebuilding America, together. Now, here's Jeff. Hour three of the Jeff Santos Show, and welcome to it, folks, coming to you live from the South Coast, uh, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, uh, great to be with you on this Friday edition of the program. Uh, again, folks, if you want to listen to podcasts of this uh, show uh, at 6.30 tonight, 6.30 Eastern Time tonight, 5.30 uh, Central, we will uh, give you all of the great guests we've had, uh, you know, the, the great uh, Harold Meyerson, Alan Minsky, Harvey Kay, and all the great callers that call into this program. Uh, and we're going to do the continuation of our next two guests. Justin Blake will be with us in a couple of seconds. Uh, and, of course, Mark Taylor Canfield. All of this available at RevolutionRadioNetwork.com, starting at 6.30 if you want to listen to the show. It runs all night, 24 hours until next Monday at 3 p.m. Eastern uh, on a loop. So the 3 o'clock hour becomes the 6 o'clock hour Eastern time, 4 o'clock, 7, et cetera, et cetera. You can do it to your time zone, whether you're in the Pacific, Mountain, uh, or you're in Nova Scotia, even ahead of us. So <laughs> wherever you are, you can check it out. Uh, folks, you know, there's so much going on in the world today. You know, we've obviously focused a lot this week on what has happened in Palestine, uh, Palestinian territory in Israel, uh, where uh, obviously I've, I've talked about, um, you know, the, the concerns over opening up here and who suffers because of this, children and teachers and so forth. And it all comes down to a concern for other humans. And when you think about it, uh, the the real essence of what... Uh, Justin Blake, uh, what, uh, you know, Al Sharpton, what so many people, uh, you know, Attorney Crump, all these leaders in the civil rights community, Ben Jealous, the former head of the NAACP, we can name them all. There are a lot of people that are not well known, that are fighting every day to stop this police violence. And when you think of what is happening on the streets of America every day goes by when we talked to her boy yesterday you know we we're talking about the brown case that brown case and the brown case from two months ago it this goes on and on and on and again I think that young people today those in their 20s who are the targets tragically if you are African American or Latino in this country you are you have a target as I said at the beginning of the show if you are driving over the holiday weekend uh, next weekend, you are white, you are privileged, you are probably going to have a good time, and if you get stopped, you're probably just going to get a warning. You're African American or Latino, and you are a mile over the speed limit, or maybe even a mile under it, they'll stop you and Godspeed to you, because I have no idea what's going to come out of the interaction. And that's where we are today. It's about human rights, and that human rights is not only here in America, it's also what we're seeing in Gaza today. Somebody who's been a long time, even before, tragically, his nephew was shot seven times in the back by Kenosha police, who still have not been arrested yet. Uh, he himself has been tortured, uh, you know, six, seven hours in a restraining chair. 
And it's always great to have a patriot and somebody who's trying to do the right thing, not only uh, for his nephew, but for, for people across this country. Uh, our good friend Justin Blake joins us from the great uh, uh, state of Wisconsin. Uh, Justin, I hope you're feeling better, my friend. Great to have you back on the show. Sam Lake of Big Brother Jeff, how are you this afternoon? Yeah. Thank you for having us. Uh, still in a, uh, uh, a considerable amount of pain due to the fact that our, uh, it's been prone proven by doctors that our shoulder was torn out of the rotator cuff and some other things have happened to our um, neck. Uh, it shows that freedom isn't free anymore. It shows the systemic racism that still exists very much in the halls of police stations, sheriff stations, and, and the government here in Kenosha. And these are the issues that we're taking head on uh, with our family for Little Jake and all the Little Jakes around the country. It is uh, a tragedy, and, and um, our prayers go out to you for a quick recovery. Uh, this is just um, deplorable. It's it's uh, it's so many words that I can use right now, some of which I'll get thrown off the air, so I won't go there. Um, but let me just say to you that I think a lot of people who know of your condition – uh, send their best wishes um, for a, a very speedy recovery, Justin, because we need your voice out there. Um, I I wonder, and again, I mentioned in the introduction to you um, a discussion I had with, with Herb yesterday, uh, and it reminds me of one of my favorite bands, uh, not my favorite band, the U2, of a song of How Long Must We Sing This Song, How Long? Yeah. And it it just seems like it never ends. And this, I, I don't know how, it, you know, you can sleep at night knowing what has happened to you, what has happened to your nephew, has happened to the Floyd family, and on and on and on. Give me your thoughts. And, and again, we're, what we're seeing in, in Israel as well, it, these are all things to me that are just, you know, they're all together, but they're just so disheartening. Well, I promise you, we don't sleep much, number one, uh, with the pain and with just everything that's going on yeah. in our life and trying to help different people. We stay up late hours, and we get up early and make prayer and get get to the next day. However, uh, we do feel uh, camaraderie with the brothers and sisters down in Palestine. If you know any about a uh, thing about the land that was not to be claimed, if you look at the map of, of uh, from way back in the days when they um, initiated Israel to present, there's been an encroachment on the brothers and sisters, and we stand with them. You think we were tortured? We don't know what torture is to some of the stuff that's been done to some of the people over there in Palestine. And as my dear brother Martin Luther King said, if there's injustice anywhere, there's injustice everywhere, and the Blake family is going to be in the fight. Well, I, I know you will be, and, and um, you know, I pray again for your speedy recovery because we need people like you out there uh, you know, telling the truth and speaking truth to power. So, you know, when you think about the, the situation in, in Palestine, and again, I was talking yesterday with, uh, with Jason Farben, the associate uh, editor, uh, associate publisher, I should say, of Jacobin Magazine, uh, you know, a very progressive magazine, and he was talking about the fact that it was uh, Black Lives Matter who had made the Palestinian cause one of their own, even before the Floyd case, even before the marches and so forth. Um, and I, I wonder, you know, if if you look at it in, in this way, it's human rights, um, you know, whether you want to say the exact terms of apartheid South Africa and connection there, I think there's a lot of similarities. Um, whether or not you, you, you look at this as just another extension of whether it's the military or the police uh, when it comes to, um, you know, just bashing heads. And, you know, we know right, and it's kind of an authoritarian mentality, and Ben Jealous has used that word with police forces in this country. I, I, I want to get your, your views here because there is, to me, a similarity. And there are a lot of people here in this country who are protesting uh, Joe Biden's visit the other day uh, here in New England. I want to get your view here because there is a, there is a lot of synergy. So um, the similarity is this, that anybody that's familiar with the Willie Lynch uh, papers – they brought Willie Lynch actually traveled over to Australia and many other nations to share these papers uh, on how to keep uh, 
African descendants subdued and how to objectify them. This went across many different nations and many different countries was, were able to read these uh, ways in which to handle people that you were trying to keep marginalized. And I'm here to tell you, you're connecting it to South Africa because South Africa definitely read these papers. Um, we believe uh, Israel must have too. Uh, it's time that we stop um, making a political ball of this uh, because nobody really wants to address it. We're funding the Israel nation uh, like nobody's business. And if they're going to continue to drop bombs on people that are throwing rocks or unguided missiles and call it a war or commit war crimes, then we need to be able to stand up as a mature country and say we're not going to back that. Uh, they've been for many years been trying to work out a two-year, two-state process. It looked like it was on board as slow as it was moving during the Obama administration. It needs to be on the front conversation of everything that's done here forward. You're tired with each other, back off their land, back up a little bit, give them their country. You guys have your country, and everybody moves forward. But it can't move forward with somebody's boot on another person's neck. We as a world can't tolerate that. We have some people that are in, in power that shouldn't be in power. Their countries will eventually deal with that in-house. But as an international family, we can't allow anybody, black, white, or otherwise, Jewish, Christian, or Muslim, to, um, to allow any person to be um, marginalized to the point where you literally control how that country and those peoples act. And I don't know the solution to it because I'd have to study some more to get to it, but it definitely sounds like the two states is a start. Let's make that happen and see if, you, if they have their own country lines and you have your own country lines and you're self-sufficient, then both parties should be able to move to some type of peaceful uh, talking with our good friend uh, Justin Blake, of course, uh, the uncle of uh, Jacob Blake, who was shot seven times in the back uh, and is now paralyzed uh, in in hospital care. And, of course, uh, Justin went through his own hell uh, just recently in a restraining chair for protesting uh, the lack of uh, any sort of uh, justice when it came to the police officer and was held and uh, now has a torn rotator cuff. Uh, and uh, because of six hours in a restraining chair, uh, and this just continues, the violence continues and continues. Uh, we're going to take a, a couple of calls here for Justin in, in a couple of seconds. Um, uh, again, it is it is really heartbreaking uh, to see all this. Now, let, let me also have a quick update. Uh, when's the last time you talked to Jacob? How is he doing? Uh, little Jake's doing well. Uh, we talked to him just the other day because I picked up some little snorkel things for his son. So when, you know, it's summer in Chicago and kids get out in the backyard and go in those little pools, I want to be able to have some fun going under the water and emulating swimming because all the Blake uh, men in the family know how to swim really well. And our hmm. son swam, biked, and ran the lakefront in the triathlon for three years straight from 13 to 19. And uh, we want them as young Blake men to be able to know how to swim and engage in water. And you start by having fun in water. So uh, we told him we had these little masks and we were up that way next. We would drop them off. He was in a little pain that day, so we didn't talk long. He's still paralyzed. But anybody to be so grateful for life as he is, I told him uh, there was a young man I posted on video that was paralyzed. They got up and walked down his street in Miami. I uh, said, you have to make, uh, like me and your dad did, we used to love lifting weights, and we bench pressed, uh, you know, over 300, 400 pounds when we were playing football, and his uncle, my brother, played with the Pittsburgh Steelers. I said, you got to take your therapy on like we used to take the weight from water. He said he was going to do that and was going to walk by next summer. <laughs> so we're praying for that. Yeah, that would be that would be fantastic. God, uh, that would be such a miracle. You know, I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, something that, um, you know, I, I know that you're trying to find, you know, some hope and justice within the Justice Department of Joe Biden. Uh, but uh, there are a lot of concerns today, and, and I, I know that uh, uh, you, you consider yourself a great progressive, a great union person. Uh, today, Joe Biden told the New York Times, and again, we're just hearing this uh, through uh, a headline on CNN, that he basically says the reason the progressives hate me is because I'm not for a socialist agenda. 
Well, the last time I checked, uh, neither is Bernie Sanders or AOC or anybody else that I'm familiar with. Uh, a socialist agenda is one that I connect with um, uh, Castro or with uh, Karl Marx. Uh, nobody is a socialist that is talking about this. I'm wondering, I don't know whether or not it's the Justice Department that you're getting, you know, sort of a stiff arm from, or whether you think that the folks within the Biden world um, are, 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 are really resisting the major changes that need to be done in this country, whether it's uh, H.R. 1 and, and Senate Bill 1, whether it's uh, ending the filibuster, whether it's D.C. statehood, uh, you know, whether it's Puerto Rico statehood. I mean, all these things that really are a big part of the future for both African Americans and Latinos, uh, which I know, you know, you have marched for. And I, I, I wonder... You know, when you hear that, you know, how disappointing it is and how um, how frustrating you must be to hear that those sort of words. Again, this is uh, not me saying this. This is CNN quoting The New York Times. Your feelings, Justin, because to me, it's shocking and, 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 and actually quite aggravating if that's what he indeed said. Well, um, we at the very least are disappointed in the uh, we walked 38 miles from Kenosha to Milwaukee to gain the support of all the African descendants in the state of Wisconsin. We made it very easy for the president to walk in after winning the state. Uh, African Americans voted three to one in, uh, uh, what was it, in uh, Kenosha, four or five to one in Racine, and six or seven to one in Milwaukee, which helped take the state. Not only were they showing support for little Jake, but they were supporting us, electing what we thought would be the president to make big change. That change has not come. We have not heard the names of Breonna Taylor, uh, Jacob Blake, um, the Cole uh, the families, all these other families in the first 100 days of his office. That should have been number one on the agenda because the people who were hurt and the families who were hurt were the same African Americans that put you in office, Joe. So I'm here to tell you if they think it's going to be a cakewalk for Sister Harris to walk into the White House that Joe Biden tries to put us sit that properly today because of the African-American and african descended community, they've got another thing coming. We are overdue, way overdue, to changing some of these things. Puerto Rico needs to be identified as a state. Uh, D.C. needs to be, D.C. needs to be a state. Why do they not want to do it? Because now we overwhelmingly put Democrats ahead in the Senate and the state in regards coming to votes. So that's why Republicans are blocking and doing everything in every state that they possibly can to stop voters from getting out in the next big election. This is ridiculous. This is not democracy, people. So if you believe and you think you're a patriot by waving a flag and supporting this foolishness, then you're a nationalist. There's a difference between the nationalist and a patriot, baby, because a patriot wants the best thing for their country. A nationalist has another agenda. So... We want you're the spot thing on. and have all of them. Even as being an African descendant and hating the way they treated our ancestors, we've always just wanted what's best for this nation and making this country better. So we're not destructive. We're not blowing things up that we built. Yes, yeah, some fires were set, but hell, not nearly the fires that need to be uh, burned out of some of these old-ass situations and organizations and government and institutes that continue to keep their boot on the back of the necks of minorities, gays, queers, and others in this nation to really see them be successful. But ultimately, if the African-American community is doing well, then that means our Caucasian brothers have to be doing tremendously well. So it's good for the community, it's good for the city, the county, and the state in Kenosha and Wisconsin or Illinois, Chicago. So stop it. Get your boot off the neck. Let's see this country be the greatest country in the world. It's not. It could be. If you just think about how many people and ideas were held because we didn't have to education of African descent. In the years, we still had a hell of a lot of things that we discovered, light posts, uh, uh, heart attack stuff, all these different things that we managed to do instead of. Where we move instead of and make it easy for so Hispanics, African Americans are definitely going to college. So they're bettering their community, bettering the city in which they live in, and bettering the country that they were born in. A uh, lady said the other day when we were in a store, and I didn't have time to rebuke everything somebody says, but how people were still 
doing the national anthem a disservice. Look, let's get over the old guard and what we thought was appropriate. It's okay for somebody to kneel, not stand, a whole bunch of things that are not violent acts to show that this country needs change. Listen, everything is changing around us. The way they pitch curveballs, the way they play football, the way we engage in work, everything is constantly changing. This country has to change if it ever wants to be the big dog on the block again in regards to the international world. Couldn't agree with you more. I'll take a quick call here for you from our good friend uh, Mark in uh, San Francisco. You are next with Justin Blake. Go right ahead, Mark. You know, when you talk about changing, uh, I'd like to talk about um, basically a way to really get at these problems. The Heritage Foundation is the one running around the country with these uh, voter suppression laws. Shouldn't we be protesting the Heritage Foundation and, and be uh, doing demonstrations in front of those people? Because they're the ones that are pulling the strings of the Republican Party. They're just puppets. But the people funding this assault on this country, stopping us from getting legislation for, for good uh, police reform, getting uh, you know, good uh, economic justice for uh, people of color, is all going to be stopped unless we go after the people funding this assault on us. No, but dear Justin. brother, thanks for pointing it out. We weren't aware that the Heritage Foundation was behind that. We know the Coca-Cola brothers and many other uh, people like them have been funding it, but we will make that uh, some homework to do so I can pass on to other people that is Heritage Foundation. You, we have to understand uh, we were neophytes in the 60s and thinking that by getting officials elected to office that things would change. But what actually runs things in this country is economic engines and those that they seek to go up to D.C. and do their bidding. So you're absolutely right. If you cut the legs out of the economic, like the dude that uh, sells the pillows, once they, everybody found out that he was with Trump and blah, 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 well, I promise you not too many African Americans bought that pillow anymore. So you got to hit them where it hurts. And if it's the uh, Heritage Foundation, I think you said? Yes, yeah. The Heritage Foundation is the one that's going around the country with, uh, with these uh, laws and, and um, going to the Republicans in each state and telling them to put this legislation uh, on the table in all these states. Well, my friend, we have quite a few followers, followers on Facebook. We know quite a few influential, influential people, and we will be forwarding that information to them so we can really get that out because we can hurt them, bro. We can bring them to the ground. Yeah, we got no, to that. people yeah. funding. We, we got to go after the people funding these assaults on our democracy because these politicians are puppets. But the people funding them are the ones that are pulling the strings. You're absolutely right. Uh, we thank you very much for sharing that. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Mark. You're spot on in your, uh, in your thoughts there. there. Justin, thank you so much. I think John sends you the best wishes. Uh, for your speedy recovery uh, and including your uh, your great uh, nephew. Uh, and uh, just Godspeed from all of us here at the Jeff Santos Show to keep fighting peacefully for all of us. All the best, my friend.